Hey guys, welcome to VLTV. Our guest tonight is a former Judge Advocate General and Counsel at Special Forces of Liberty and de facto Attorney Generals. He describes the group as a Christian version of the ACLU. He is here to tell us what he has been up to in the last few months, taking several bills to uh, various states. Welcome to our show. Chris Sevier. Hey, Chris. See you, buddy. Hey, uh, thanks so much for having me. Chris. So, if it's okay, I'm just going to dive right in, or we'll go ahead. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I was going to say, it seems like you've been really busy. Yeah, so, I mean, basically, we have two, we have eight, about eight bills we're running that are divided into two separate legislative narratives. We wrote the bills out of multi-state federal litigation, so every word of the bill is backed by normally federal constitutional basis, but also controlling Supreme Court precedent. So we're, we're not like the left. We don't write bills out of emotion. And we're not like many people on the right who do the same thing. We have a legal basis behind the bills that we're presenting. So again, they can be divided into two narratives. One group of bills deals with human trafficking, social media censorship, form, various forms of sexual exploitation, things of that nature, pornography, human trafficking, mainly censorship. Those are the main things. And then the other group of bills deals with you know, stopping the LGBTQ community from persecuting Christians, defunding Planned Parenthood, and strengthening marriage. So I'm just going to kind of touch on both of those two narratives. Um, they're both equally important. They're just in different areas. So the first bill is called the Human Trafficking Child Exploitation Prevention Act. It's a bill that requires uh, all retailers and manufacturers of products that distribute the Internet, so that's like laptops, cell phones, ISPs, to install filters to automatically block websites that display X-rated materials and websites that are facilitating human trafficking. The Human Trafficking Prevention Act tells the retail stores and the manufacturers in the state where the bill is being presented that henceforth, manufacturers and retailers of products that distribute the internet and make content on the internet accessible have to first pre-install activated filters that automatically block prostitution hubs, child pornography, revenge pornography, and obscenity as it's defined under the existing obscenity codes, which can only be removed if the consumer is over 18 and shows proof of ID. If the consumer is an adult and they want to have access to adult websites, they can. They just got to show proof of ID with a retailer, pay a one-time nominal fee of $20, which goes back to the state. So where the family groups that are fighting to uphold community standards of decency that are fighting human trafficking can apply for grant funding, and the internet will be exactly like it is right now in all of its glory. And so it's basically a burden-shifting scenario. When you buy a laptop cell phone, consumers are going to have to, have to opt in to have access to that X-rated content. And, you know, we always say at the hearing, why is it that a 12-year-old in the state of, like, Texas, for example, can't go see an R-rated movie, uh, they, can't play a, they can't buy a Playboy from the gas station, but they can walk around with an X-rated theater in the form of a filterless iPhone they got from the local Verizon store. It's a matter of science that pornography hijacks dopamine, beta-false B, oxytocin. It adversely impacts the reward cycle in the limbic system. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's, so there's, I could go more into the weeds of that, but that's generally the bill. And so if there's groups out there, parents that would like to have their children better protected or reduce human trafficking, we ask them to help get behind that bill. Uh, another bill that's really popular right now is called the Stop Social Media Censorship Act. It's a bill that creates a private right of action for any user in the state that's censored for religious or political reasons by a social media website that has more than 75 million subscribers that was never affiliated with a political group or a religious group from its inception. And that injured party can now have standing to seek attorney's fees and minimal statutory damages of 75000 The Stop Social Media Censorship Act was written in response to social media websites censoring Christian conservatives who tend to vote Republican for religious and political reasons. The first part of the act states that the state will treat social media websites that were not affiliated with a religious group or political party from its inception that has more than 75 million users open to the public as public utilities or quasi-state actors or natural monopolies. This would have the effect of subjecting those specific websites with complying with the state and 
federal constitution. Social media websites that fit that category will have a difficult time explaining that they're not natural monopolies. But the first section of the bill is not nearly as important as the second section. And in fact, in some cases, might not even be included. The second part of the bill creates a private right of action for users within the state who've been victimized by social media websites for having a different religious and political worldview than the employees who work for the social media website. These are contract law matters. And contract law is a state law issue. The act states that if there's a social media website that's open to the public, that was never affiliated with a religious or political organizations from its inception, and if it has more than 75 million users and markets itself as being open to the public, that those websites can be sued by users who are censored for religious and political reasons because that kind of censorship constitutes breach of contract, fraudulent inducement, unjust enrichment, bad faith, and unfair dealing. Victims of that breach will be permitted to sue the social media websites in the court of competent jurisdiction and seek $75,000 in statutory damages, attorney's fees, and costs. They can also seek actual damages and punitive damages. So that's really going to put the kibosh on a lot of the censorship we have, we see going on. And so we're really asking folks to help, you know, take that bill and take it to their state senator, state legis state house representative, and ask them to push that bill. Because we got to push that. We can't be complacent about these things. And so th there's more bills that fall within that narrative, but those are the main two that I wanted to hit on. But I'm not going to shift to the second legislative narrative we have. And we have a bill called, we refer to it as the Marriage and Constitution Restoration Act, uh, but, it's, but we're now calling it the Disentanglement Act. Uh, it's a bill that says four things and is backed by two primary pieces of evidence. And it's especially important that this bill move forward, especially given Pride Week, Pride Month is going on. And there's been no real material pushback against the LGBTQ community. A lot of legislatures have been too afraid to do that. And they've got to get over it, grow up, act like adults, and you know, basically enforce the Constitution as they require. So one of the points of the bill says that pursuant to Article 6 of the United States Constitution, it doesn't matter if a House or Senate member is a Republican or Democrat, they have a duty to only create and enforce policies that do not violate the United States Constitution. Point two of the bill gives something to the left. It says in view of the First Amendment free exercise clause of the United States Constitution, Anybody in any state can self-identify as anything they want to. Homosexual, polygamous, a zoophile, a transgender, a chicken sandwich, whatever they want. They can have wedding ceremonies and they can live as married people do, for better or for worse. Point three of the bill is that in view of the First Amendment Establishment Clause of the United States Constitution, the state and federal government are prohibited from endorsing, enforcing, recognizing, or respecting any form of marriage policy that doesn't involve one man and one woman. Any kind of drag queen story time that's hosted by the public library, paid for and promoted by the public library. Any government uh, going to pay for sex change operation policy. Any uh, transgender bathroom ordinance. Any um, the government's going to pay for sex change operations or, you know, um, any uh, sexual orientation discrimination statutes and so forth and so on. Because all of those policies are non-secular in nature. They're actually non-secular shams that cultivate indefensible legal weapons against non-observers of the religion of secular humanism, and they serve to excessively entangle the government with the religion of secular humanism. So all of those policies fail the Lemon Test and therefore violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Point four of the bill is that the state will continue to enforce and endorse and recognize marriage policies between one man and one woman, because man-woman marriage policies and man-woman marriage those, those are natural, neutral, non-controversial. They don't put religion over non-religion. They actually accomplish their purpose. They're not a political power play. To back up the, this bill, we have testimonials from thousands of ex-gays, persecuted Christians, licensed ministers, and medical experts, all of whom testify under oath that there's no proof of engaging. That the idea that sexual orientation or homosexuality or predicated on immutability is not proven. But that sexual orientation homosexuality, transgenderism, those are a mythology, they're a dogma, they're an ideology, they're a worldview that's inseparably linked to the religion of secular humanism. The United States Supreme Court in Torcaso versus Watkins, and just about all the other federal court of appeals have found that secular humanism is a religion for the purpose of the First Amendment Establishment Clause. So basically, the Disentanglement Act balances the free exercise clause with the, first, with the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment and informs the states that they have to drop kick and completely get rid of all pro-LGBTQ policies. 
here's the kicker. The United States Supreme Court has already resolved that secular humanism is a religion for the purposes of the First Amendment Establishment Clause in Torquezo v. Watkins and Edwards v. Aguilar. Therefore, the Marriage and Constitution Restoration Act balances the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution and informs the state as to how it has to respond to marriage requests of all kinds that do not involve one man and one woman and how the state must respond to self-asserted sex-based identity narratives that are questionably real, questionably moral, and have a tendency to erode community standards of decency. This objection is not based on bio bigotry. It's based on biology. It's also based on what the Constitution of the United States requires. In the wake of the Obergefell decision, we have not seen tolerance and unity and all that stuff. What we've seen is a land rush, not on gay marriage, we've seen a land rush on Christian persecution. Mm -hmm. We've seen a land rush on the LGBTQ secular humanist activists infiltrating elementary schools and public libraries for the sole purpose of using the government stamp of approval to indoctrinate minors to a spiritual take on reality is a per se violation of the United States establishment law. And you know, the left, all they have is emotional appeals. There's really good case law, like the Holloman case, for example, where the court says emotional appeals cannot be used to usurp the establishment law. And so we really need the groups to help us push that bill. Because LGBTQ, the government's in marriage or entanglement with LGBTQ policies is, is really severely damaging the country. And it relates back to our human trafficking bill because, you know, it, all of this erodes community standards of decency. All of it's promoting, just like prostitution, child exploitation, homosexuality, they're all forms of sex that are self-evidently immoral and it tend to erode community standards of decency. We're not trying to prove or disprove whether or not there's a gay gene or whether or not homosexuality is immoral. We're saying that those that, that sexual orientation and homosexual ideology are religious, and therefore the government's got to get away from it. Okay, so another bill we have is called the Life Appropriation Act. We would submit that this is by far the most superior bill that deals with defunding Planned Parenthood yes. and abortion facilities. There's been a lot of states, red states, that have passed bills that say, we're going to defund Planned Parenthood because we're going to defund it, okay? And there's a lot of left, left states that have passed bills saying, we're going to finance Planned Parenthood because abortion is a civil right under the 14th Amendment, and therefore we have a duty to not deny poor people the civil right of abortion, okay? Both are horrible and wrong approaches to this question. The Life Appropriation Act we have is predicated, it starts on the premise that when someone says that life doesn't begin at conception, that abortion isn't immoral, that it's not murder, those are a series of unproven faith-based assumptions and naked assertions that are implicitly religious and inseparably linked to the religion of secular humanism, which brings back up Torcaso versus Watkins and the significance of the Supreme Court recognizing that secular humanism is a religion. We, we call it a lot of times postmodern individualistic moral relativism. That's kind of long, so we just kind of reduce it to secular humanism. But the bill says, you know, the states, like a state, the state of Texas, for example, is prohibited from giving federal or state taxpayer dollars to facilities providing convenience abortions. That means abortions that don't involve rape, incest, one of the mother's lives in danger, because those procedures are non-secular in nature. And that appropriation has the effect of excessively entangling the government with a religion of secular humanism. It's basically paying for modern day child sacrifice on the altar of convenience. Mm -hmm. So, so it failed, that, that, that kind of appropriation would violate, fail the problems of lemon and therefore violate the establishment problems. The Life Appropriation Act is founded on the idea that when someone says that life doesn't begin at conception, that abortion isn't murder, and that abortion isn't immoral, those are a series of unproven faith-based assumptions and naked assertions that are implicitly religious and inseparably linked to the religion of secular humanism. The constitutional legal basis for the Life Appropriation Act is the First Amendment Establishment Clause. The Life Appropriation Act prohibits the state from appropriating any funds to any facility that's providing convenience abortions. Convenience abortions are abortions that do not involve of rape, incest, or when the mother's life is in danger. The act prohibits the state from appropriating funds to facilities conducting convenience abortions because those types of abortions are non-secular. And for the government to endorse those practices, symbolically or directly, has the effect of excessively entangling the government with the religion of secular humanism. But let me try to explain it in more common sense layman's terms. We re really, the principle comes from either Martin Luther King Jr. or Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And basically, um, it's a principle that, that goes like this. This is the, here's kind of the reasoning behind this all. There are thousands of people in every district, every state, who sincerely believe that abortion is immoral. 
it follows that they also believe that to enable acts of immorality is itself an act of immorality. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the state and federal government should not be giving a penny to any facility providing convenience abortions because it causes those taxpayers to violate their own conscience by the simple act of paying taxes. So it's an evil that the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment was designed to prohibit. And so, you know, when I tell the, 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 the very blue Democrat, you know, in office that narrative, you know, they kind of shake their head and go, yeah, I can think, they can think of at least one person in their district who doesn't want their taxpayer dollars going to that. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, it's get, starting to gain a lot of bipartisan support. The human trafficking bill that I mentioned, the first narrative should have bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. The Stop Social Media Future should Act should have bipartisan support insofar as even though it's majority of Christian conservative Republicans who are being censored online, someday that could flip and go the other way. We'd like to have, you know, different opinions voiced out there without the threat of, you know, fascism, without the threat of kind of, you know, bullying and censorship and intimidation. Mm -hmm. So also what goes with this narrative contemporaneously is just a resolution that resolves that secular humanism is a religion, that the states are going to recognize it as that. But while secular humanist speech is religious in nature, in another sense, it's disfavored, harmful speech because that speech tends to erode community standards of decency. I mean, abortion speech tends to pro proliferate promiscuity. Homosexual speech tends to proliferate adverse forms, of, adverse forms of sex that do not, you know, accord with the givenness of our nature, the truth about the way we are and the way things are. So, I mean, it's definitely a fight. We definitely would like to see more people, you know, getting on board with us and take the bills that we have and the talking points to their state legislature. It's an easy mission. We have the language. What's really hard to do is to get the language. We have that. What's really hard to do is we have talking points too. We, they really need that as well. And we have the, we have you know done our job of like kind of vetting it to make sure we've got all the case law on our side, and we really do. So now it's just a matter of can we get the groundswell of support in state after state to help us push these things into reality? And if that occurs, it's going to substantially marginalize what the left has been trying to do, and it's going to really restore a lot of freedom, bring about a lot of, it's going to promote the truth. You know, without truth, there is no freedom. Freedom comes from the truth. So the bills that we're promoting are basically advancing the truth. And the truth is, is that LGBTQ ideology and, and, abortion, and, and abortion ideology are implicitly religious. And therefore, that's what they are. And they need to be treated that way and classified that way. They have nothing to do with civil rights. I do believe that we are defending the integrity of the civil rights movement, spearheaded by Pastor Martin Luther King, because we're stopping the left from hijacking the 14th Amendment and creating, you know, basically making, argument, trying to classify things as, as dealing with immutability, American tradition and hi history that have nothing to do with either one of those things. So that's, that's kind of a general summary of the legislation we're working on. We're going to bring a prayer and school bill that we've got what we're working on. We've got um, another bill that requires um, parents to opt their, their kids in to sex education programs. If they want the kids to attend, the parents have to opt in. Instead of they're opted in, they've got to opt out. So we're working on that bill. We, we have um, some other things we're working on. One, one bill we're, we're, we're thinking about running is to require the schools to have more fruits and vegetables at the cafeteria. I mean, so, I mean, that's, you know, hopefully that would be bipartisan. Oh, you know, so. but, yeah. uh, just, it, it takes a lot of times, you know, I, I, citizens, private citizens, doing the work for the legislature. It takes us getting the language together, doing the real homework, getting really into the weeds, and bringing it to them on a silver platter. And if you have a lot of people there showing up to the state house doing that, you know, you'll push things into law. If people just are kind of quiet and complacent and you know, sit back, like then the other side, they're definitely very aggressive. Yes. Their ideas yes. are ridiculous they're terrible yes. but a lot of people see a lot of the left just see the government as a religion they see it as their church and they live for trying to get in the endorsement of the government they want the government to tell them that they are redeemed and they're okay for living a lifestyle that's objectively immoral yeah. but yeah. the government's not a church it's not a redeemer it never will be yeah. and so the government really needs to be neutral on a lot of these different things so yeah, there you go. That's that's a fire hose for you right there. I love yeah. it. No, I took it all in. I love it, man. Um, so how many states have you been to to present yeah. these bills? 
We have about 37 states we've got traction in in some way. I mean, New York's about to introduce the Life Appropriation Act. We're really excited about that, that especially in the in response of the late-term abortion bill. We just had a hearing last week in Rhode Island. It was great to be with all the Democrats and have them going, this makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, but we're, we're trying to run in a lot of the red states. We, we've been, the, there's some people that have such strong animus towards our team that, you know, we would show up in Georgia and in Missouri, Kansas, South Carolina, where Capitol Police is literally following us around and harassing us, like just wow. absolutely trying to derail what we're doing. And a lot of the police officers are like, we're just following orders. We don't know who this is coming from. We don't know really who it's coming from either. Well, we can assume, but it's definitely people that they can't stop us with our arguments. So they're trying to like, you know, they're breaking the rules, if you will, to accomplish ends that they can't get otherwise. But if we have locals take the bills around and they, they, they push that, that's going to help us get into a hearing. When there's a hearing, that's where we need to show up to testify for that. So we've got the language. We can cover the hearings, but what we need more of are local folks in, in their own state saying, yeah, I, I want to stop the, the LGBTQ takeover of our government. Okay, so I don't want to say, say we wanted to take your bill. What, would, what exact steps would individuals take in order to, to get this accomplished? So there's a, there's a few ways. There's no, there's no manual on any of this, but you have a goal. And the goal is to get a legislative sponsor in the House or the Senate to start with. Once you get one, it becomes pretty easy to get somewhere else. Uh, you also want to think about what committees they're on, what their values are. But even if, even if you know, there's, 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 no, there's nothing wrong with shotgunning it because the ideas are really good. They're, they're ideas that were basically, the bills are basically saying, they're based on common sense, number one. And number two, they're basically bills that say, the United States Constitution already requires you to do this. Mm-hmm. And so basically what you would do is you could either call or email the members copies of the bills. We have videos too. If, if someone wanted to get involved, we could give them a template and email that we send out. Very short, but you can just be yourself, you know? Just basically, I want this to be law in our state. And then another thing that's really, really helpful would be if they printed off copies of the bill and the talking points and went to the state house and took a copy to the individual members, take them to their office. If they're not in session, it's okay. Print it and take it to their office. And uh, if, there, if there's interest and the member wants to talk to somebody, you know, then they can talk to they can talk to me or John or one of our team members who can really break it down. But the, the legislatures love it when a local constituent brings it to them. Doesn't mean they have to write it. I mean, the problem with a lot of the the, the legislatures is they they have this fantasy of some constituent coming up with some idea and bringing it to them and they write it and it passes and blah blah blah. But the problem is is that the stuff we're working on, abortion, LGBTQ issues, fighting tech companies, they're so complex that the only possible way to even write a bill is to go through an enormous amount of federal litigation. Because that's how you figure out what you can do and what you cannot do. So we're sitting there going, when I'm with legislatures, I'm like, we're not smarter than you, okay? But what we've done is we've gotten into the fire pit to figure out what we can do and what we cannot do. And after the smoke is cleared, here is the answer. Now, do you want to make this law or do you not want to make this law? Which one would it be? So, but, you know, again, what we really need is, more volunteers. We, you know, they could reach out to us. We could give them assignments. We can put them on mission. And everyone that comes and does anything for us really likes it because they're doing God's work. I can tell you that. They really are. And you don't have to be an expert. You just have to be hands and feet and willing to go. That's basically it. So uh, what would a lawmaker have to do to vet what you're saying? You know what I'm saying? You, get, you give them this bill. They're looking at the bill. What would they do to vet that to make sure everything is? The number one, the number one thing is we always say this. We always say it's all about the language. And these bills are like three pages, four pages, eight pages maybe sometimes. Then we got talking points as well. We kind of have two versions of the talking points. We have the short version. We have the long version. The short version gives them like the most important bullets they'll need to help them vet. And then the long version goes more into the weeds of things. And so it's pretty easy. Even if they're a non-lawyer, they can basically, most of, most of them have know enough about the law, you know, they're legislators, that they can pretty quickly say, yeah, this is really great. You know, the other thing that's helpful is we've had tons of bills introduced. So maybe that can indicate that there's some plausibility and merits to the bill, you know? And the other thing is, you know, they could talk to us. We could point them to the case law. We can point them to the language backing us up, 
that's what, again, that's what I like about our stuff is it's based on authority. It's not based on what we feel should be the case. We're basically saying this is what you're obligated to do. And if you don't do it, you're in violation of your duty pursuant to Article 6. A yeah. lot of the Democrats go, well, the surrounding states are in violation already. I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't make it right. You know? Yeah. So, so, um, so, but there's, there's, they, have, they have their own counsel as well that can then, you know, they're not one of us. They can look at it. A lot, of, a lot of times, even those guys would be leftists, so sometimes they lead them astray, or uh, even when we deal with, like, some of the folks that are supposed to be our allies, like Liberty Council, who I like, Alliance Defending Freedom, who I like as well, for the most part, Family <laughs> Research Council, who I like sometimes. You, know, even, you, would think that, you would think that they would be Jay Seculo, who I like all the time. You, you would think that they would be, like, really gung-ho, but the problem is, is that They've never framed the bills the way that we're framing. They haven't swam through the litigation, you know, rings that we've been crawling through. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have been around for a long time. They're kind of set in their way of thinking. They're kind of like, well, the left is drawing the battlefield. So we might as well operate within that. But not our team. Okay, we're a bunch of former army guys. Because I'm a former military officer. We never fight on the battlefield that someone else picked. We always say, no, we're going to decide where the battle's going to be fought. Where the battle is being fought for the most part, where the bills we're presenting is within the exclusive jurisdiction of the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. The Establishment Clause with the Free Exercise Clause. Well, the um, left likes to yeah, I'm sorry, the Fourth Amendment. But yeah, go, go ahead. Right. No, I, I was going to say that you're putting it all out there, bro, and, and there's no excuses right now. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens because you're doing all the work and uh, – you know, I, I want to see uh, if they go uh, with this and, and, and take it to the next level, because if not, it's going to say a lot about our country and the state that we're in. Well, what's interesting is that, you know, first of all, the Democrats are not an option. I mean, they're just right. like, they're, their idol is power, okay? And they'll do getting everything to keep that and get it. And a lot of times they don't know the objective difference between right and wrong, real and fake, secular and non-secular. So they are a total disaster. For the most part, some of them, they kind of stick together and some of them have back, very strong convictions, which is a lot of times the convictions are completely the wrong direction. And then the, the Republicans, some of them are great. Some of them are just really solid, uh, but some of them are really weak and feckless and they don't really know which way to go and they're not always on the same page. So we like Republicans generally, and we, but we just, you know, we want those that are not, that, that aren't trying, aren't believing that they're going to be in office forever. They're not necessarily trying to run for president. They want it, They understand that while they're there, they should, you know, grow the cojones, if you will, to try to advance right, something that's actually right. And those guys, those people do exist. It's really a thing of having the public stand, get forward to take on our bills to help take them around. Yeah. That's hugely important. Even if there's just a group that walks the halls together and takes a copy of the paper, they don't even say anything just prints the copy and they all walk together and take it down the hall. Yeah. has a huge impact on them. Yeah. That, it kind of like, yeah. Go ahead. So, I'm sorry. Were you going to say something? Are you an author of the bill, Chris? I am. Yeah. I, yeah. I would say the main author of the bill are people like Justice Scalia, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Thomas, because basically what we're doing is we're in federal court really getting hammered and shot at. Big kind of incredibly monstrous leftist judges appointed by Obama in a lot of yeah. cases yeah. and in, an amazingly hostile liberal media that's out of control, but we don't care about them. We're not, we're not in high school. We're not trying to win a popularity contest, but we're in there and we're, we're fighting it out. And through the fighting, you know, we're reading all of this case law and we use language that maybe it's Scalia would. I mean, th these judges are, these Christian conservative judges are absolutely telling the legislature what to do all the time in their dissents and their opinions. So it's a matter of we have to go through and find and kind of read between the tea leaves and then we pull language from them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the guys that helps write the bill. And then I've got, like, constitutional law professors who might come in behind me to kind of, like, check some stuff. I've got a lot of former judge advocate generals that are on my team that uh, also kind of are kind of checks and balance, you know. So Right. Yeah, I, I wanted to pull back a little bit about what I said earlier about Democrats, Republicans, because I, I know that there are actually conservative uh, Democrats as well. I know maybe that's not the norm, but but there are that probably have conservative values. So I don't like to say Republican, Democrat. I, I like to say more conservative values. And I think that's where you're coming from. I'd say Christian versus non-Christian. 
basically. Yeah, and I hate right. to say it, but I mean, almost everything that we're dealing with is yeah. one side is promoting Christianity, the other side is promoting secular humanism. The difference with the distinction is that we as Christians are not trying to make Christianity the official national language of the country. Right. Because if we were to do that, it would create the very form of legalism that Christ himself was so adamantly opposed to. But what we, so we're not necessarily out to legislate morality, but we're, not out, we're also there to stop the left from legislating immorality. It's very, a very like, fine line with all of that, and, uh, but it's a, disti- it's a distinction with a difference. So, yeah. Um, and what is the name of the group? What is the name of your group? We call ourselves Special Forces of Liberty. Okay. And de facto attorney generals. The de facto attorney generals are normally the lawyers that are involved in our team. that are part of the litigation. Special forces of liberty are the ones that are walking around, kind of pushing the bills. Non-lawyers that are, you know, reaching out to the state. So. Okay. And um, are there websites and places that people can go to get more information? There is. We basically had websites for all of our bills individually. So humantraffickingpreventionact.com was kind of a main hub that we started out with our first bill. So we kind of kept using that one, and then we created individual websites for all of the bills. But what we decided to do is to kind of make one website. So we hope that we think that's going to be up by the beginning of July. Okay. So we're going to have all of the materials, all the videos. Very, we will make, make things really simple so that you know, lobby, people who want to help lobby the bills can follow it, the legislatures can follow it. So that will be up by the beginning of July. Amazing. They'll have a list of the litigation we've been involved with. They'll have all of the bills, the language. For each state, they'll have the talking points. They'll have videos that are about three minutes each that explain the bill yeah. very well. So that's going to be that's going to all be up. It'll be under specialforcesoflibrity.com. It'll be under de facto attorney generals.com. It'll be the same website. Right. So let me ask you: what, <laughs> Which bill do you think will be the easiest, and which one do you think will be the most difficult? I think a life appropriation act is going to be kind of easy. There's a lot of states that have already tried to defund Planned Parenthood. Yeah. But the problem is, is they, they don't have a constitutional legal basis for why they're doing that. And it's vulnerable to attack. And it really needs to be framed in the way that we're framing it. So there's some already roads in there. I think Stop Social Media Censorship Act is pretty popular. I mean, they've got to do something. And we've given them the answer. It's just half a bill. So, and the public needs to know about the, the bill and know that there's a solution. A lot of times people look to the federal Congress to say, fix it. But the federal Congress, first of all, is going to be completely inept because the Democrats control the House mm-hmm. and the Republicans control the Senate. So that whole thing is shut down. Mm-hmm. And the only good thing about Congress is that Trump and McConnell are pumping the federal judiciary full of red judges, which is really, really helpful. But... Uh, um, but it's really a state law issue because when you sign up to use a, so, a social media website, you're entering into a contract. Yeah. The states have paramount jurisdiction over contracts. Mm. So that's why it's really a state law issue. Our bill is the solution that we think that will really put some real teeth to stopping the social media censorship that's taking place. So, that, so that's, that's an important fight. For, and uh, then the Human Trafficking Child Exploitation Prevention Act should be such a no-brainer. But it's been like pulling teeth. They get them to want to regulate the tech companies. And I don't know why. It's not like the tech retailers really have all that much power. It's just like they get them to all see like, yeah, maybe 12-year-olds shouldn't be looking at torture pornography websites. Then going right. across the street and acting out what they saw in the 11-year-old, 7-year-old neighbor. I mean, maybe that would be good to make it where the content's blocked by default, including prostitution. And then maybe it'd be good to you know, find all these groups that are fighting human trafficking because we will never prosecute our way out of it. And so, you know, it's, it's a, really, it's a game of, I mean, the thing I always know is they're like, no one ever wants to be first. They're all terrified of being embarrassed, which makes them embarrassing a lot of times. Yeah. And so it's just about pressure. And they, they, a lot, I mean, a lot of them really want to do the right thing. They want to do something good. Yeah. And um, you just need just kind of like a constant drip, like a constant pressure. And then the other thing is it does take a minute for them to wrap their heads around it. Yeah, you know, the ACLU will show up and go, this violates the, staff, this violates the First Amendment. They'll just walk away. And the tech realtors or the, some of the tech companies will show up and go, you know, we've got money. We're smart. You need to leave us alone. And they'll walk away. You know, their, bas- their basic argument is Apple's argument, for example, or Verizon's like, we're Apple, we're Verizon. Therefore, we're above the law. We should be able to do what we want to do. Right. 
That's much. in a nutshell what they argue. Yeah. And we're sitting there going, no. Supreme Court in Asheville versus the ACLU found that filters that filters are the least restrictive means, and that Congress and Dowdy may act to encourage the use of filters. That's a direct quote. Or in the Ginsburg versus New York case, where they found that the display statute is constitutional under First Amendment heightened scrutiny. The display statute, the statute that requires the retailers, like the 7-Eleven, the gas station, to put the Playboy, you know, behind the shelf, yeah. or, or like behind the blinder rack. Yeah. Okay, we want a digital blinder rack and post. So, I mean, we've got, like, the controlling case law absolutely on our side. Now, the only reason we found that case law is because we took Apple to federal court and fought, fought them over this stuff. But, you know, a lot of times the judges are looking at us going, this is really great what you're doing, but you know you've got to get the legislature to do this. We're like, that's fine, but we're going to use the federal courts as our own private, you know, legislative research council to vet the law. So we've got the language, and we've got the instruments. Now we need the people to help taking us around. Yeah. We need help yeah. with the people. So what are the exact steps? If, if somebody takes the, these, if they print everything off and they take it to their local um, person who represents them, all their representatives, yeah, yeah legislators, what, what happens then? So if they're looking for a sponsor. That's the magic language they're looking for. They're looking for sponsors and co-sponsors. And then it's really simple. They just go, Okay, I'll introduce the bill. They then take the language that we wrote, they take it to bill drafting, and bill drafting goes, yeah, that's pretty good. They just copy and paste it. Plus, we've had just about every state introduce something, so we can give them that state version as well if they need it. Then they give it back to the sponsor, and the sponsor introduces it, and then we really want to have a hearing. So it gets assigned to a committee. A lot of times, you want to pick someone, who could, it'd be ideal to have a sponsor who's on a certain committee, like judiciary, it doesn't really matter that much. You just want a willing person, you know, uh, ideally someone who's respected. But I mean, again, like the ideas kind of carry themselves. And so um, then there's a hearing and the hearing we show up and testify. The committee will vote yes or no to let it move. If it votes yes, then it goes to the House floor, let's say, or Senate floor. And there's a total vote there to whether to pass it to the next chamber. A lot of times there's a hearing in the next chamber on the same, on the same bill got to pass out of the committee there there's a second vote you know on the floor there and then it goes to the governor's desk to sign if the governor signs it it becomes law wow here's the thing the reason why it's so critical to have every state run the bills even the blue states even the really crazy blue states is because it gives political cover to help the red states pass the bills into law it really starts changing the whole way they're all thinking about the bills. so yeah that sounds great i mean it seems um a little i don't know i i felt like maybe there were more steps but that could actually happen like that seems like a pretty simple thing to no, do i really i really appreciate uh what you guys are doing by the way um and the steps that you guys are taking and it's like you're, it, you're making it a no-brainer and all people have to do is get involved you you've, you've got all the the wording there already so All the it's, work is done. It's, it's a beautiful thing really yeah what's great well the thing is is that to create the wording we my team is so demonized i mean yeah. i've been called a stalker who, <laughs> who has is incapable of practicing law who is like this the worst who's a porn addict even though i'm fighting pornography who's <laughs> the, the, the worst human like the worst person you could imagine i mean just f fake news all of it none of it's real you know basically my sin is stepping in the political arena that's it you know mm -hmm. it was like so funny because i always say when i was a military officer you know, working as a lawyer things were fine as soon as i put my toe into that stream like all hell breaks loose but the reason why it's so cool great for for you know, just people who live in the state that are just, you know, law-abiding citizens, Christians, they're not involved in politics. Why it's so good for them to take the bill through the door is the hands and feet to deliver it. It's because they don't bring in that baggage. Now, once, you know, it's, it's, it's in the hands and they read it, then they go, wow, this is really good. Mm -hmm. You know, who, who are the people that can testify? And at that point, then they go, okay, this is great. But it, it gives them a huge amount of political cover, you know? Yeah. But, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, we're just people on the street ourselves. Like we have no, we're not, you know, we're not, uh, we're not legislatures. We can't introduce anything. We can only bring it to them and ask them to carry something. But what's, what is never helpful really is when people just show up and say, 
I want to see a change. Like, okay, that's it's not doing very much. Yes. Them the language and the talking points mm -hmm. and evidence that other states have introduced it too. Yeah. There's a video. That's now you're really cooking, you know? We've got all of that. And we've got bills that like play really good in, in terms of like a cohesive legislative narrative. And it, it makes all of them look really good. And it's like, it helps them get from point A to point B where they want to go. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm like basically like, look, if you want to defund Planned Parenthood forever, introduce this bill, Life Appropriation Act. If you want to stop the state capitol from hoisting the gay pride flag, if you want to stop the LGBTQ from hosting drag queen story time, if you want to stop the, the persecution that's just continually getting out of control, introduce the disentanglement act. If you want to stop social media censorship, introduce the stop social media censorship. If you want to reduce human trafficking and protect children and encourage marriages to be stronger, introduce the human trafficking and child exploitation prevention act. And then you know, folks could get once they're introduced, and you, then you got something you can really rally behind. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, again, it's going to prove a lot, you know, as far as whether they think that their constituents are going to back them up or not. And so we're going to really see what the uh, pulse of the country is right now. It, it helps, you know, and, and most of the time, like a lot of the legislatures, they don't, know, they don't know what to do. They feel very helpless. A lot of times the general population feels the same way. Mm -hmm. What I know we can do is defund Planned Parenthood forever with state, federal and state taxpayer dollars. Yeah got to be framed in the way that we're presenting it for different reasons. And then we, I know that we can get the government totally out of the LGBTQ endorsement business, which by the way, will probably cause the whole LGBTQ community to implode because it cannot survive without the government's endorsement because it's too absurd. And everybody, everybody knows. Okay. So, why yeah, is, so why is the government endorsing them? For a lot of reasons. Number one, votes. Uh, it's uh, basically the Democrats are basically like they want the government to be the church and the redeemer. Yeah. They appeal to people's guilt is what it is. They go vote for us, join our party, support us. We'll make sure you feel not guilty for living a lifestyle that makes you inherent. It's inherently shameful. Okay. So it's basically they use government to help explain away the natural feelings of inadequacy and shame that come from, it putting moral relativism into practice and so that's that's kind of the appeal if you will so so it's votes so basically it's just no, no, okay. question it's absolutely votes and it's also i mean the default set of setting of the human heart is me first and so the bottom line is that it's um, easy for someone to say you know join my party we're going to tell you if it feels right it is right yeah. You know, that, that's the, that's the broad way, if you will, in a sense, yeah. So there's an appeal to that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, basically the, 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 the Republicans kind of take on the Christian approach, which is kind of a grace based, you know, justice is real. There's also grace as well. And it's, um, there is such thing as absolute truth. And then you have another group that's basically the legalist, which is like, you have to obey all these moral rules to earn your way to heaven. And we're going to promote a worldview that looks like that. So to me, there's basically those three camps. You have yeah. moral relativists, you have grace-based Christians, and then you have these works-based righteousness types. And a lot of the works-based righteousness types or the moral relativists are on the left. And, uh, but, I mean, their positions are objectively irrational. And they really are. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they're always saying, you know, we're always saying, you know, without morality, Without faith, there's no basis for morality, and without morality, there's no basis for law. So quit pretending that morality is a basis for law. doesn't matter. The left is saying that no one moral doctrine is a, is, should be used as a superior basis of law. And we're like, excuse me, that is a moral basis. That is a moral doctrine. What you're advancing should be the, moral, the, the foundation for law. Right. So, you know, if an army officer like me has a duty to disobey immoral orders. The question presented is, which set of moral doctrine can I rely on to determine which orders are immoral and which ones are not? So really it's basically, generally speaking, Christianity that has the answer. We're not trying to legislate or mandate Christianity, but what we're basically saying is that law should be predicated on self-evident truth, self-evident morality, which by just coincidence normally parallels the doctrines of institutionalized religion. So it's kind of a fine line there, but it's still a line that's, that's real. So, if, um, you know, if the Bill of Rights, if parts of the Constitution 
parallel Christian principles, like the 14th Amendment. You know, man is made in God's image, which comes directly out of Genesis, it says. Mm -hmm. That's, that just parallels it by coincidence because it's self-evidently true. So we just want the laws to be based on self-evident morality, which by, ha by, you know, by happenstance parallels Christianity a lot of times. So, but these things are very nuanced. And, um, you know, for example, the human trafficking bill we have, we're not trying to outlaw pornography. We're not trying to prohibit even sex trafficking websites totally. But we definitely want them blocked by default. Yeah. Kind of like strip clubs. Like if someone wants to build a strip club in your city, they can do it. But the state legislature can zone them to the hard to reach parts of town. Yes. They can make it very inconvenient to access. Right? Yes. Yeah. So that's what we're doing with the abortion. We're not trying to get rid of abortion. Yeah trying to you know i think fetal heartbeat bills are great we didn't come up with that bill but we definitely support that right and, you know we also um we know we can defund it that's what i know we can do yeah but, you know i do think that the blue states if they want to make it to where abortion happens you know later term they probably can get away for doing it for right now at least um but you know the, the, i would definitely hope the red states pass all the fetal heartbeat bills mm -hmm. so, uh. so you put limitations on things but total prohibition kind of a different story right rein it in a little bit because it's so out of control right now my head spins every time i i hear these guys talk i'm like what are they saying what yeah. it's really crazy no uh, i mean I, I there's nothing that you've said that i disagree with to be honest with you i just i you know sometimes i think it's going to be a hard sell because uh the society has gone in such a luciferian way right now so I, very much yes I, I mean, a lot of people are brainwashed by secular humans I mean, that's what it is. It's literally brainwashing. Yeah. The idea of homosexuality yeah. is like the gay civil rights flight is like the race space civil rights flight is objectively false. Okay. We have thousands and thousands of testimonials from ex gays who are radically transformed by Christianity yeah. who left it behind completely. We have mm -hmm. testimonials from medical experts that say there is no proof of a gay gene. This is religion. Stop yeah. contacting our profession. But they're like, love is love, love wins. And so it's a refusal to think logically. But you know, fortunately, a lot of the people in state legislatures think very logically. And if we can get the bills to pass when they're challenged, we have the, we have the legal like, arguments together already to help the attorney general's office defend the laws. And in the state, the courts are becoming redder and redder and redder. So now's yeah. a really, really good time to push on this. It's really about, it's just, it's all about passing things through the red states and then knowing that the, the courts are going to really uphold them in a manner that will become law for all 50 states, including Oregon and Massachusetts and so forth. Very cool, Chris. And one more question, and, uh, and if Andrew wants to ask you a question. Um, I just want to know what, what's your experience been with Texas, our great state of Texas here, as far as so trying here's to... here's about Texas. There's a lot of representatives I work with. A lot of Representative Swanson was going to do the marriage and was going to do the Human Trafficking and Child Exploitation Prevention Act. My my good friend Representative Briscoe Kane, who I think might still be the youngest legislature there, he might be. There might be one other, but he he's a great guy. He was going to do the Life Appropriation Act. He helped me find Senator Hughes to introduce the Stop Social Media Censorship Act. We really couldn't get anyone to do the Disentanglement Act. There was other, you know, bills that were anti-LGBTQ, but I don't think they were nearly as good as the ones that we came up with. Mm -hmm. I think they were a lot of them were based on a, a motion. I really like the heartbeat bill that Briscoe Kane introduced. I think it's great, um, but I really hope that someone will carry the Life Appropriation Act to really deep. There were actually there was one senator who introduced a bill to defund Planned Parenthood. I went and testified at that hearing. And, uh, but she's not using the right, correct constitutional framework. Cause a lot of them just don't understand things yeah. about the constitution. They just don't get it. So, but we're there. I hope they really take that on. Um, but here's my problem with Texas. Texas is a state legislature that meets every other year, just like Arkansas, just like Nevada, just like North Dakota, just mm -hmm. like Montana. There's other states that do as well. But the, generally speaking, the state legislatures that meet every other year are immensely difficult to deal with because they're not they're not they're not really professional legislatures because they're not in all the time. So they're kind of they're weaker than like South Dakota, Missouri, Tennessee, that every year they have to get together and they have to show up and they have to go through this. The, even the bill drafting is better at the states than are every year. Um, the other problem with Texas is that there's you know almost 30 million, 28 million or so people living in Texas. There's a, there's millions 
it's next to California. It's the second biggest state. Wow. And the other problem is that when I go to the legislature there, they usually have, you know, it's, it's like basically like being in D.C., being dealing with Congress. They have like staffers that are five deep. Or if I go to Oklahoma, you've got one staffer and the member. That's it. So when I go to Texas, I'm dealing with five people who think that their member is a member of Congress. And I'm like, this is a state legislature. This is not Congress, you know. And uh, but in their defense, like they do have more people to deal with, you know. And so um, it's harder to break through. The, the other problem is that legislation is getting more complex. It's not simplistic. It's not, you know, the low hanging fruit of legislative ideas have been taken. So it takes severe sophistication to do anything with these things. This is why groundswell support is very helpful. I just think Texas is such an important state because a lot of the country, and we know from our channel, people commenting that it's the, it's the buck stops here. I mean, it's the Republic. It's very, and it's very, very, very important for that reason. Let me, give you, let, me give, let, me, let me add to that argument. So Representative Lars Lone, Representative Jennings, for example, in Wyoming, introduced several of our bills, okay? Wyoming has maybe 500,000 people living in that state on a good day. Texas has, you know, almost somewhere between 25 and 30 million, okay? That's like a country. Yeah, so if yeah. Texas passes things, it's really easy for all the other states to say, okay, because yeah. none of the other states want to be first. Mm -hmm. So if Texas would just take the lead, so the way to really push this and make this law would be for folks in Texas to take the bills now and lobby the bills now and lobby them hard to the members, find them, get sponsors committed now, you know, mm -hmm. that's the way to do it. And then work, you know, get all of them to understand it, meet with them, get their support, that kind of thing. Okay. Another thing that would be good is go to the state house. Go to the state house. Doesn't matter whether your member is from Fort Worth or not. Okay, that's it. That's like an old timey romantic idea of like, my constituents going to walk into my local office. And they're going to complain about water pipes, and I'm going to yeah. mystically come up with a water pipe bill, and we're going to fix the problem. And I'm going to be the local hero. Okay, that does not exist. Okay, yeah. what what exists would be. Take the bill to the to the state house, walk the halls, meet with their staffers, or meet with them. If you can get to them, that's always great, you know. But try to get the staffers sold the cheapest staff, and then they'll they'll hook it up with it with the member because they'll go, "Well, this is really good," you know. And uh, but also, if you can contact the member directly, that's helpful. Yeah. And another problem with like Texas is there's the there's Jonathan and Nicole from the Texas Family Values, which is basically Texas Research Council, who basically declares a monopoly on all religious bills being going, going through there. And so they go around and try to kill anything that they did not come up with. Oh Meanwhile, my. Nicole is not a lawyer, A. Jonathan is, both of them I like. But Jonathan's probably never gone to federal court ever one time, okay? So we're showing up in his territory and, you know, there's a problem because they're going, well, go run it by that group, you know, because they know what they're doing. I'm like, they really kind of don't. In yeah. fact, I would rather run it by the ACLU than those guys sometimes. And, I, and look, I'm, I'm not trying to talk bad about Jonathan. I'm not trying to talk bad about Nicole. If they are in this room right now, I would say the same thing to their face, okay? So is, that, like, is, it, an, is it an ego thing? What, what, so what is it then? Well, here's the thing. Every state has its own separate family policy council. Some of them are amazing, very humble, very helpful. Some of them will say, and this is what I like, this is, I think this is the best approach, when they go, we have our bills, you have your bills. We don't really understand your bills. You might not understand our bills. You know, just let, let's just go, everyone push as, as we best we can. That's the approach I think is the best approach. Then there's some states, and I'm not saying Texas is one of them, where the family policy group is unbelievably territorial to the point where they are by far worse than the blue groups, by far. Concerned Women for America, Family Resource Council. Some states are amazing. In other states, they are the ones you have to stay away from, okay? Now, so it's a, it's a real serious misdirection because those groups depend on donations. And if they don't have the ideas, and a lot of times they have no ideas, then, you know, they become very desperate, you know? 
Hmm. Um, it's, it's really a case by case basis, not even based on the organization, based on the heart of the individual that's there. Okay. I mean, NCOSC and DC is horrible when it comes to being territorial. I've never seen anything like that. It deals with hmm. fighting human trafficking and pornography. They will crush anything that they didn't come up with because it competes with their donor base. Then there's other groups that are anti-human trafficking, refuge for women, who are outstanding, who really help move the needle. Um, so it's, you know, what I really like the best are just people who are not involved in politics, folks who are Christians, people who are willing to show up and take the bills around. Especially people who feel like they don't know what they're doing, they're in it over their head. Those are the best because really all you got to know is what are we trying to do? Yeah. We're going to we're gonna try to stop social media censorship. Okay? Yeah. Try to defund Planned Parenthood in a way that will last forever. We're going to try to get rid of the LGBTQ community from going around and persecuting everybody. Yeah. You know, things like that. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it to where you buy a cell phone and a laptop. Prostitution websites are blocked by default along with X-rated content. Okay? That's, those, those are the goals. Here's the instruments to get you there. Yeah. You don't even have to read the bill and understand it. I mean, half the legislatures can't even read it and understand it. Sometimes. Yeah. But their staffer can, you know, and they can go, yeah, this is really good. This is great. This makes a lot of sense. But just getting that groundswell is super important. But there, it is spiritual, okay? This is all Ephesians 6. Yeah. There's a lot of spiritual warfare that goes on. It really is. Oh, yeah. yeah. So sure. having people that have that mentality is helpful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. So local is not, local's not going to help. Anybody who's in your district, you shouldn't really go there. You want us to take it to the, the, to the capital, to our state, state house. Gotcha. I mean, what's really amazing to me is like, it's so, I've got really, 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 really good team members. And they are unbelievable about making phone calls and sending emails. I mean, phone calls and emails and phone calls and emails. But when you physically show up to the state house with the bill idea in your hand and the talking that really makes them go, well, we got to listen to these people because we're gonna, I mean, they're physically in our face, you know? So it, it, it really shows you're serious. You go to the state house. Right. And, you know, there's also caucuses. There's a freedom caucus. Um, I'm going to draw a blank on the, it's Matt. I don't want to say it's, no, I'm going to call Matt Shea. That's legislature. The, the, the head of the freedom caucus, I'm picturing, you know, I can't, I can't, say his name for some reason it's the tip of my tongue we'll get it <laughs> him if you go to leadership and you get them signed on then they help bring in other members to help carry bills but you need you need to find friends make friends and find allies and but it's really as simple as just take the bill around and say find the chief of staff that's another buzz term that's really important for texas the chief of staff has a lot of power or the senior law, law legislative policy director the policy director for the office you find those and you give them the bill and say, other states are doing this. I want Texas to do this. I but, agree with you, by the way. Yeah. Texas is vitally important. Yeah. If Texas does it, everyone else says, now we yeah. can do it. You know? No, I, 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 I agree with you. It's huge. And, um, and I liked what you said, uh, the term uh, groundswell. Uh, you need a groundswell because uh, ju just bringing it to a representative and saying, hey, check this bill out. That, yeah, that, that's going to do something, but he needs to know that there's going to be a groundswell of people that are going to back that up. It helps. I mean, I'll give you an idea. John Gunter, who's going to be on this phone call with me, I call him Sergeant Major, okay? <laughs> calls me Lieutenant, because that's what I'm yeah. First Lieutenant. And so um, he emailed Representative Price from Rhode Island. Representative Price kind of looked at the bill, language we sent, skimmed it. Watched the video and goes, wow, this is really good. Called me and goes, I think I'm interested in carrying all of your bills. I said, okay, well, let's talk through it. Senator Still from Oklahoma introduced all the bills. Wow. Representative Garber from Kansas introduced all the bills. And, you know, it's, it's, he called me and, go, and, you know, me and him talked and we talked it through and he's like, this is great. I'm going to do it. Took it, you know, introduced it. We have no groundswell. We have no support, nothing. We had a hearing. Fortunately, there was a lot of pro-lifers there that we could go round up and say, we're trying to defund Planned Parenthood. Maybe you should come to that hearing. And they yeah. came, sat in, and some got up and testified, too, that we met there. Okay, so even without a groundswell, 
we did all of that. We just, we took the bill. We emailed it in that case. He yeah. goes, this is good. Called and we talked it through with him. And then that came about. But if you combine all of it in Texas, you really need a groundswell. We really have the ideas that are there. We really do. The ideas yeah. are there. The language is there. The talking points are there. We have a video that explains the bill. I always tell the legislature, I'm like, if somebody comes to you with a bill draft that other states have done with talking points and a video explaining it, you probably need to really listen to that, okay? Because that doesn't exist, all right? So we've got all that. Then we have multiple bills, and we're going to keep adding to it because I think, we, I think we're kind of getting it down, you know? So, yep. Chris. Really yeah, you're doing great work, you guys. I mean, I really appreciate it. And, and we're going to do what we can here in Texas. We got to get it done. Texas and Arkansas, we got to get both of them. It'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank right. you for taking time with us. We really appreciate all the information. We'll pass this along and get it out as much as we possibly can. Chris, God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, so I'm a, a <clears throat> former judge advocate general, uh, was in the United States military, went to Vanderbilt undergrad, Vanderbilt Law School, was trained on what's called the rule of law mission, which I was working with the United States to help other countries kind of obey their constitution. And a lot of us, you know, judge advocates uh, have returned back from combat and we're kind of trying to help different states or different government agencies kind of obey their constitution as well. So I... I'm not really appearing as a partisan for Republicans or Democrats. I'm a proponent of the United States Constitution. And um, the issue of abortion is very controversial. There's a lot of passions on both sides about whether, you know, abortion should be limited at fetal heartbeat or should be allowed at to the time of birth. But the bill, the instant bill today ha does not take up that issue. The question presented in the instant case here with House Bill 5599 is can the state of Rhode Island appropriate taxpayer dollars, whether it be state taxpayer dollars or federal taxpayer dollars, to facilities that are providing what's called convenience abortions. And so this bill addresses that question. The short answer is that it cannot. And uh, because the United, because the First Amendment, United States, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, the Establishment Clause prohibits that. And so I'm just going to kind of dive into what the bill kind of says in a nutshell. And the bill starts kind of, it's predicated on the idea or the premise that when someone says that life does not begin at conception, that abortion isn't immoral, that it's not, immor that it's not murder, those are a series of unproven faith-based assumptions that are implicitly religious. Those are positions that are inherently linked to the religion of secular humanism. The United States Supreme Court has already found that secular humanism is a religion for the purpose of the First Amendment, Establishment Clause. That was a case called Torcaso versus Watkins. Just about all the federal court of appeals have also found the same thing. And so this bill basically goes on to say, therefore, that the state of Rhode Island is prohibited from giving federal or taxpayer dollars to any facility providing convenience abortions, which is narrowly defined to abortions that don't involve rape, when the mother's life's in danger. Um, but it's just basically a matter of someone wants to get rid of the, the child. Because those procedures are non-secular in nature. And, and for the government to appropriate that kind of money, um, would have the effect of excessively entangling the government with the religion of secular humanism. And so it would convey to members who are here from abundant life that live in this state and pay taxpayers that the favored religion of this state is postmodern individualistic moral relativism is what a lot of us refer to it as in federal court, but the Supreme Court referred to it as secular humanism, so we stick with that. Basically, that appropriation fails what's called prongs one and three of the lemon test. That's, that's a test that we use in federal court to determine whether or not government action is religious or not. And so the, the courts have held that if government action fails one of the prongs of lemon, the state cannot engage in that activity. So I'm prior military. There's a lot of individuals on this, this uh, panel that are, private, that are prior, private military, all of whom have taken a different oath at some time to uphold and defend the United States Constitution. Every member, when they became a, a legislator, doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat, 
agreed to uphold the United States Constitution. There's a provision of the United States Constitution called Article 6. It says, you know, every state representative, every Senate, state senator, the governor, the, the attorney general will um, not create, introduce, or allow for government action to violate the United States Constitution. So this is a bill that's, that causes the state of Rhode Island to be in accordance and in obedience with the United States Constitution. And so I just kind of gave some legal kind of reasoning behind the bill, but here's how to explain the bill in kind of layman's common sense terms. And that is, every, there are thousands of people in the state of Rhode Island who sincerely believe that abortion is immoral. And they also believe that to enable acts of immorality is itself an act of immorality. Therefore, for the state to, the state should be prohibited from appropriating those taxpayer dollars to the facilities providing convenience abortions because it causes those taxpayers to violate their own conscience by the simple act of paying taxes. It's a coercive act. Some people would say it's completely crazy for someone to say that life begins at conception. Abortion is completely permissible and should be allowed. Other people would say, no, life begins at conception and I don't want to have blood on my hands to enable this activity. And we're not really here to prove or disprove any of that, but the question presented is should the state of Rhode Island or should any state or should the federal government be giving money to facilities providing convenience abortions? And the answer falls, the evidence would show that the evidence falls exclusively within the confines of the First Amendment Establishment Clause. And the answer to that is no, it cannot. If the state of Rhode Island would take the lead on that and take some initiative on that, I, I sincerely believe it would set a tone for the rest of the country to come under that. And then, you know, the debate on other aspects of the abortion, I think, are going to con continue on. I know there's very strong arguments on both sides of that. But, in the narrow, you know, we're in the finance committee, and this is a narrow issue. Is should the taxpayer dollars be go to that? And I would call upon the committee. I, I'd appeal to your oath of under the Constitution to – support and pass this measure. And that's, that's basically it. Thank you very much for your testimony, and thank you for your service, too. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank uh, you so much. Thank good. You I met you earlier, and I know we have uh, a lot of things in common. Okay. Are there any questions from, any of the, witness, uh, from the panel for the witness? Yes. Uh, Rep. Rep. Price. Mm -hmm. The Ohio ruling, is that... Um, in conjunction with any of this, the, whether the Supreme Court ruled on Ohio's ruling, or should we even address that at this point? Is this dealing with heartbeat bill? Um, <clears throat> the defunding. Or well, that's true. Yeah. There. Okay. So there. There's. I'm a part. I'm part of a litigation team called De Facto Attorney Generals. Also. Okay. I, but it, it's okay. No. Before it gets started, I just want to make sure we are staying narrow on. If it's related to the bill itself, okay, okay. Um, this bill, yeah, yeah, it's. it's I, I know what he's talking okay. about. There, okay, there was funding. a decision regarding defunding abortion facilities. The legal basis in that case is a different, different one. Okay, thanks. And, and the instant case here, you know, I'm part of a uh, litigation team called De Facto Attorney Generals, and we're involved with uh, the federal litigation right now, dealing with whether or not. The, uh, f the Trump administration can withhold uh, funding to Planned Parenthood through Title X. And we've actually intervened in that case on the side of Planned Parenthood, the plaintiffs. And we're saying that, that we agree with Planned Parenthood that the guidelines are not clear. But the reason why this, the federal government can't give appropriate federal taxpayer dollars is the same reason why the state of Rhode Island can't because that appropriation violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. We're reframing this question under the correct controlling constitutional prescription and narrative. And so this is a different approach to it, but it's based on, you know, Rhode Island's part of a constitutional republic. So the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and the state and federal government both must not engage in any kind of action that would violate that. And so we're basically, this bill, and the different arguments that we're making and other groups are making in federal district court right now come from First Amendment Establishment Clause jurisprudence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brett McLaughlin. In, in, in reference to, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, this question hasn't been answered. Uh, basically, 
uh, is the U.S. Congress and the United uh, you know, States Senate in violation? Well, let me, let me, let me, so let me answer of our Constitution. that question, but keep it narrowly tailored to the instant bill right here. Yes. Right now, the state of Rhode Island is in direct violation of the United States, Con <laughs> United States Constitution any, every year that it gives money to facilities providing Planned Parenthood. So, yeah, facilities providing convenience abortions, okay? Uh, anytime the federal government gives money to facilities providing convenience abortions, it's violating the United States Constitution because it's, it is entangling the government with the religion of secular humanism. That's not a creative argument. That's what the evidence would show that's taking place. The question you were asking is why have they been able to do that or why hasn't it been stopped? What's been the legal basis uh, for, for doing it? And there's really not been a very solid one. Just like there's a lot of like so-called red states, for example, that every year they say, we're not going to give money to any facility providing uh, convenience abortions because we're not going to do it. And I'm like, that's not a legal basis. You're just doing it because you just feel like you shouldn't. Whereas the other blue states say, we feel like we should. I mean, the problem is, is that there has been a, I would say at best tenuous legal basis in the past for why states could, or the federal government or state governments could give money to facilities providing convenience abortions. It would come through Roe versus Wade or Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which they used the 14th Amendment, substantive due process and equal protection clause as basically the underlying legal basis saying abortion's a fundamental right. But we would say that that is a bunch of nonsense. Issues like race, those fall within under the 14th Amendment Equal Protection and Substantive Due Process Clause purview because race deals with immutability and substantive due process can only be raised if the matter involves American history and tradition. Abortion has nothing to do with immutability whatsoever and has absolutely nothing to do with American tradition or history. So the misuse of the 14th Amendment is something that we've been taking very seriously. We're trying to defend and restore the integrity of that. And... Um, so I don't know if I'm, I'm going too much off topic, but, the, but, the, but as it stands right now, the state is in violation of the United States Constitution for, for appropriating funds. They are standing on behalf of taxpayers, like the ones here today from uh, Abundant Life, that would have standing under federal district court to proceed to enjoin the state from making that appropriation. But instead of doing that, the honorable thing to do, respectfully, I would submit, would be for the state to say, yeah, that makes sense. If there's one person in your district who does not think abortion is moral, their taxpayer dollars should not be being used to advance that non-secular procedure. <clears throat> if the mother's life's in danger, if it's a product of rape or incest, those are exceptions. Those are a distinction with a, that's a distinction with a difference, we would submit. And those procedures would be secular, but I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, And my, Shut, my last and final question uh, would be uh, under the, um, the First and uh, 14th Amendment and the Sixth Amendment, uh, the penalties for so, violating. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a, uh, the, the state of Rhode Island, would, would they be subject to any penalties? And by the way, so it's, it's the First Amendment Establishment Clause is what this bill is based off of? Yeah. And then we're saying the 14th Amendment has no jurisdiction over this issue whatsoever, that that was always a misuse of the law. I'm also referring to Article 6 of the United States Constitution. It's okay. not the Sixth Amendment, but it's Article 6, which Article creates six. The, the duty, yeah. Yeah, the oath of office, just like you take as, a, as an army uh, when you join the military. Yep. Um, and the penalties for that right now would be an injunction. So right now, the state could be held accountable in federal district court through if a taxpayer in this state who didn't believe that abortion, they didn't want their taxpayer dollars being used in that non-secular manner, being appropriated in that way, they could seek relief from the federal district court, the state of Rhode Island, to seek a preliminary and permanent injunction to stop the... Um, to stop the, uh, the, the the state from doing that, and then they would probably also be entitled to seek other forms of relief as well if they could show actual damages. <clears throat> but there's no um, that that would be the, the prospective penalty. We, you, you could ask the courts to enforce the make the state obey the constitution. Thanks. But instead of doing that, in the instant case here, this is a hearing, and we're asking the state legislature to pull the state to be within the to obey the Constitution. And it's not based on my feelings. The Supreme Court has found in Torcaso versus Watkins that secular humanism is a religion for the purpose of the First Amendment <coughs> Establishment Clause. It is self-evident that when someone says that, that abortion isn't murder, that it's not immoral, that they cannot prove that. When someone says life does not Thank begin you. at conception, they can only pound the table. 
then they can only make that position based on their feelings. But the courts have made expressly clear, especially in the, the Holloman case, that emotional appeals, emotional feelings cannot be used to usurp <laughs> the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. So. With, the, with that said, I want to thank you. And uh, uh, one statement you did make in reference to it takes one person. And I, I just want to say this, and it, this is not germane to the subject matter, Chairman. So, uh, you know, with that said, it took one person in the state of Rhode Island to try and get rid of all the crosses, uh, crosses on our war memorials, okay? And they filed that in one socket. And you're absolutely right. But they were defeated, okay? Uh, my bill defeated them. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, bills do work sometimes. Yes, uh, are there any questions? Of the yes, week? Mr. Chairman. Oh. Uh, Rep. Uh, Rep. Amore and then Rep. Uh, Diaz. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Are, are there cases pending anywhere at this at this point in time? It's in any it's, state or any federal court. In California, there's one, but there can be a whole lot that would be unleashed in a moment's notice. Right now, there's probably about. I know New York is, is, is copying, plagiarizing this legislature, right? The House Bill 5599, they're about to introduce it. There's about seven states or so that have introduced it. And so um, normally before you resort to, resort to litigation, we feel that it's wise to go to the states to say, here's what the facts, here's what the evidence shows, here's a, the leak, here's a constitutional controlling, controlling legal basis based on controlling Supreme Court precedent, based on what the facts and evidence show, for why the state should not be appropriating money in this way. But you would agree that constitutional questions historically have been settled through the courts. They can be, and I'm sure no matter what, they will be. So if, if, if Senator Blackburn from, <clears throat> from uh, Tennessee and D.C. introduces the federal version of this bill, which is very likely to happen, and it passes, let's say, passes the Senate and somehow passes the House, let's say, and the President signs it, Clearly, I'm sure it'd be litigated. So no matter what, it, it's probably going to be litigated. And um, yeah. So, but but, but another well, thing you, you raise is there. We've had citizens have had standing. They've had standing under this argument since 1973. You're correct. Flat. flat there's a there's the, the establishment clause jurisprudence is unique jurisprudence because it's the only one upon which taxpayers can have standing taxpayer standing to ask the government to obey the Constitution. And so you're right in that there's a lot of states that are not in compliance with it. We'd also argue that there's a lot of red states, for example, that might, you know, they are in compliance, but if you ask them why they're doing it, they have no legal basis for it. So, I mean, there's like Tennessee passed a bill saying, we're not going to give any money to facilities providing convenience abortions because we're not going to do it. Louisiana did the same thing. If I worked for Planned Parenthood, I was their lawyer for the ACLU, I would sue the state of Tennessee and say you have no basis for doing it. But, you know, instead, you know, again, the courts are great. The courts are supposed to be a, a, a check and balance on the legislative branch, but it's great when the legislatures can get together, doesn't matter which party they're from, and say, this makes sense. Now, let's fight it. We can fight it out over, should we allow abortion up to the fetal heartbeat or should we allow it up to, to you know, the, the time of birth? That's a different kind of fight. But the question presented here is, should these taxpayers, should taxpayers in your district who are vehemently opposed to this have to have their taxpayer dollars going towards that? That's the question presented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Chairman. You're quite welcome. Rep. Diaz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very quick. Um, it's a lot of information to digest today, and it's also confused because one thing is right, another one is not. It's kind of confused for the viewers if for some of the members here. But my question to you is, uh, it, it will be Rhode Island the first state doing that or the similar legislation passing other states already? So there's about six states or so that have introduced it. Pennsylvania is about to. New York is about to as well. They're about to introduce the bill. It's been introduced in different states, and there's been some hearings. And but this is a newer concept mm -hmm. because it's never been framed this way. It's never really been the, the arguments have never been framed that way. But that that's a very fu good point you're making, and that is, I'm saying my position is that I'm here to testify not based on my feelings or what I think should happen. I'm pointing toward Tor the Supreme Court decision in Torcaso versus Watkins, where the Supreme Court found that secular humanism is a religion, and then we have a litany of other cases decided by the Federal Court of Appeals, they would say that, yes, yeah, secular humanism is a religion. And then the evidence would show that abortion, pl convenience abortions is non-secular practices, and the government can't endorse those things. Representative mentioned crosses 
own um, in, a, in a graveyard, for example. Can the government pay for those? And that would be something that would have to be debated back and forth. There could be there, there's other ways to justify things, compelling state <coughs> interests, and whether or not it, you know whether other monuments there displaying that were religious. Every case has its own set of facts and circumstances. But in the instant case here, the evidence would show that you know, the First Amendment Establishment Clause was never just designed to prevent the government from endorsing the, the edicts of non of institutionalized religions like Christianity, Judaism, you know, Islam. The First Amendment Establishment Clause was designed, if not more so, to stop the government from endorsing the edicts of non-institutionalized religions as well which abortion, convenience abortion practices do fall within. Okay, so when you was trying to answer my question, you mentioned that, <laughs> because it's a long answer that Sorry. you give it to us. Lawyers but it's good, it's good. You mentioned that a few states already passed the law. Um, uh, so <laughs> they've introduced it. Introduce it, no yeah. one passes no yeah. one is, That's correct, it has not been signed okay. by a governor yet. Okay. Uh, because my question was following that part in case it was passed, if they are in the process to uh, any litigation or anything, but it's not passed, I don't have to ask the question. But thank you. It's a great information that you share with us today. Thank you. Thank you. I, 